Um, we're also uh, organized by Autism Network Scotland and kindly supported by the Autism Network Scotland who have generated um, a, uh, a culture, I suppose, of autism-friendly applause. Um, and this is um, the silent hand wave, like this. So we'll just do that um, instead of clapping um, a, as, a, as a way to, um, to accommodate uh, anyone with uh, sensory sensitivities. So we can just practice a little uh, applause. <laughs> Hooray. OK, so thank you very much for that. Um, we also have a quiet room, which is just out the double doors. It's the little corridor on the right-hand side as you're leaving the room, um, and it's labeled quiet room. So if you feel the need for um, a little peace and quiet, some solitude, um, please feel free to use that room. Uh, please respect other people um, that are using that room. Um, and it's yours uh, there all day if, uh, if you so choose to use it. Um, we are also doing some filming. The filming will be predominantly the, the speakers and the, the, pre the presentations. Um, but if um, you may be inadvertently uh, filmed, in which case, if you feel uncomfortable ab about that, would you please let either uh, Leslie Evans know about it, the organizer here, or um, uh, uh, one, of, one of our two photographers. Uh, and finally, fire safety. Um, so there's no intended uh, fire drill today. So if um, we do hear a fire alarm, we have an exit on your right-hand side and on your left. Actually, uh, sorry, your right-hand side and left-hand side. Um, and, of course, through the double doors and back down the stairs that you came from. Um, there is an exam downstairs. I'm glad that you didn't sit in the exam. Um, that's not what we're doing today. Um, this is much more exploratory. We want to discuss material. We want to look at it. We're not testing you. Um, but we need to look at this material and to understand it. And the, the purpose of this and why um, this is a, um, uh, an innovation in, in autism practice is that we need to take this research that is, um, is typically siloed in, in science departments um, and, and research conversations. And we need to bring that out into uh, practical work with children and individuals with autism um, to try and improve our professional practice, um, to improve uh, their uh, chances and, and, and their, life, their lifelong success. So that's our goal. Um, and, and we need discussion to be able to do that. I'm not a practitioner, but we do have practitioners that are speaking today. Um, and I'm delighted that we have um, Professor Nicole Reinhardt and Professor Jennifer McGinley um, from, uh, from Melbourne, Australia, who are both researcher practitioners. So we chose them uh, in particular because they do research and they do practice. So Nicole is a clinical psychologist, but also um, a, a, a research intensive practitioner. Um, and Jennifer McGinley is a physiotherapist, um, and she also um, is, is very intensive in, in, in research. In fact, these two have produced probably one of the largest bodies of work in the autism disruption, um, autism movement disruption literature over the past 15 to 20 years. So we're delighted to have them, and I'll introduce them properly soon. Okay, so our aims is to, are to better understand um, the nature of the motor disturbance in autism, so understand what that means, what it is, to better understand its implications for learning and development, especially in, in young children, and communication and connection, whether that's a, a child or an adult or, or any other person for that matter, and to better understand how to support children and adults um, with autism, whether it be in education, uh, in, in, uh, in care, um, or in, in medical therapies. And finally, uh, to share knowledge both ways. And this is the important part of the, the, the discussive aspect, right? And which is why we also wanted to keep the, the group relatively small. Um, so that we can generate discussion and we have, quite, uh, we have a good panel session at the end where we can talk about these things and we can try to move forward uh, as, a coherent, as a coherent body. Um, uh, and finally, to enjoy each other's company. Um, we have time, we have coffee, we have good food. Um, we have time to mingle and to share our professional expertise and, uh, and experiences and, and make friends, um, meet old ones and make new ones. So that is our uh, aim for today. Okay, so the seminar marks uh, the end of this two-part series, let's think about where we're going to go for the next steps. Uh, how do we incorporate this, this new knowledge? Should we beginning, begin to think about incorporating it into sign guidelines, for example? Um, can we include it um, in the autism toolbox, uh, for example, in, in order to, to raise awareness about motor issues there? Um, do we need additional research practice seminars like this one? Perhaps we, we can make these an annual event. Um, do we need focused, smaller focus group workshops throughout the year, perhaps? Um, that might be another step forward. So make these uh, recommendations in discussion or in, in the feedback sheet at the end, please. We do read those and, and we, we, uh, we take those to heart. So today's program, uh, I'm introducing until 10 o'clock, and then um, Nicole is going to come on. 
with her talk about odd gait clumsiness uh, and other abnormal motor signs, which is the DSM-5 criteria, I believe, word for word. Um, and she'll discuss that um, uh, in, in, in a lot more detail and try to understand exactly what that means. Um, then we'll break uh, for uh, coffee and refreshments in the principal's dining room, who's been very gracious to lend us uh, the use of uh, his space there. Um, and finally, then we'll move on to Jennifer McGinley to look at um, enhancing motor function and looking at some practical aspects um, of improving uh, movement skill. We'll break for lunch and come back, and we have two workshops that I'm delighted uh, to share with you. Uh, one from uh, Richard Brooks um, from uh, Oxfordshire, where he does a particular motor therapy uh, with children um, with ASD in order to improve their functional skills. Um, and from the basis of improving their functional skills, he finds and his wider group find that their socio-emotional skills will improve um, and their communication uh, and, and um, understanding of others uh, will improve as well. And then we have Jennifer Cook, who has produced some very interesting data on the motor deficit in autism, the motor disruption. Um, and she'll share with you some, some new insight about how we move to express emotion, to express feeling. And I think there's going to be an interactive uh, event using iPhones or, or our mobile phones in our pockets. Um, so we'll get a little bit of insight about what computation, what we can get from these sensors um, that are now in our iWatches or our iPhones or the, the Android device that you have. Um, they're picking up a lot of information that can be very informative. Um, and we're working, uh, especially in my group, um, to make use of that um, for clinical purposes and for screening purposes and things like this. And then we have our discussion panel, um, which I'll introduce at the time, and then, we, then we'll just wrap up. So that's today. Um, so let's proceed. So I'll just give a very quick, um, now 10 minute, to keep on track of time, introduction to why movement is so fundamental and, and why it's important. Does anybody have any uh, questions about the, the general layout um, of the day before I get going? Okay, so movement as experience. Now, um, my background is as a biologist, first and foremost. So I'm interested in life. Um, and I'm interested in, in this big question, what is life? You know, why is it distinct from, from what is not life? And this is philosophical as well as, uh, as, well as biological. Um, but in my studies, it, came, uh, it, it became quite clear that one of the fundamental differences about what is living and what is non-living is movement. So what is living is organized and orchestrated movement. It's movement organized by the individual agent or the individual animal. Now, the interesting thing is when you organize movement in that way, you need energy. And you need to organize it purposefully as well because it needs to serve the purpose of the organism to sustain its vital existence, its life. That's, that is the nature of life. Rocks, tables, and chairs, they don't do these kinds of things. Um, they're rather static, and they have no capacity to generate um, energy and to organize movement for their particular means, for their particular ends. Um, so this is, this is really important. And when we think about uh, movement being disrupted, we can see that that disruption uh, will disrupt a fundamental aspect of what it is to be a living creature in the world and to therefore act purposefully and meaningfully for oneself um, and socially with other, with other people. So the, uh, the autism strategy, which is being revised, um, has had three uh, primary aims, um, to, um, to encourage a healthy life, to encourage choice and control, um, independence and active citizenship of individuals with, with ASD. Now, movement being so fundamental to, to what it means to be a living uh, creature in the world uh, intersects at many points um, in this strategy. If we understand movement and can support movement better, we begin to understand how it supports the, the, the substrate or the foundation of these particular aspects. I've just highlighted um, some words uh, in, in red here to, to, to bring that out. A healthy life which is enjoyable. Now, what I'll, get, what, what I'll get out in the next few minutes is when we move well and we move efficiently and successfully with others, that generates satisfaction. It generates a, an affectivity associated with it, um, a very basic kind. Um, and that um, elaborated is enjoyment. Um, when we can elaborate that in, uh, satisfaction and share it with others, we, we generate joy. Uh, healthy and a healthy family life as well, of course, is built on sharing um, these particular intentions that we enact through movement. Um, and dignity and respect um, is very important because if we see someone moving differently than us um, and we don't give them the respect to attend to their particular way of moving, their particular way of being, um, then we begin to uh, disrespect them um, and they, their dignity is diminished. Um, and that's not, of course, a very healthy thing. And I think that's one of the key messages that we can uh, achieve by understanding movement is that if you move differently, 
It doesn't mean you're not moving purposefully or have your own particular intentions behind it, but just that they may not be perfectly aligned with, with yours, with your particular expectations. Choice and control, well, movement is control. It organizes how we uh, engage with things. Um, we reach to, to pick up a glass of water. We move with a particular purpose to, to do things. And we need to do that in a, in a controlled way, um, although that doesn't need to be necessarily a rational, top-down, um, uh, restrictive control. But it's simply a, a way of moving with the um, op opportunities and affordances of the moment. Um, independence, if we can move well, then we can move within our, within our capacities. And we can expect to achieve the things that we set out to achieve. Um, and this gives us that independence, or it gives us as much independence as, as we want or as we can achieve. Um, and again, movement is at the heart of that because it's the foundation on which we do all of the things that we do. You know, the, the quote I've put in the abstract um, is from uh, Sperry, who says, the sole product um, of brain function is motor coordination. There's nothing that the brain doesn't do um, that's not eventually communicated in the acts of the body. The voice is a, is a very fine and refined control of the musculatures. The gestures that I'm uh, displaying are controlled um, expressions of my feelings, intentions, um, and desires to communicate a particular effect to you. Um, similarly, with active citizenship, if we have that foundation, we can then integrate in our culture or in our society, whether that's a small intimate family um, or a wider social group um, or indeed the, the, the wider nation as, as, as a whole. So movement really, because it's so fundamental to how, how, who and how we are as living beings, um, supports many of these aspects um, that are key practical um, uh, outcomes for, this, for the Scottish autism strategy. Okay, so I'll just uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the um, principles behind moving um, and some of the aspects about moving um, that uh, are important for understanding why it's so important to move efficiently and therefore why a disruption um, uh, is, is so uh, important to attend to. Um, the, the first principle is I like to move it because when we move, we're moving from where we are now to where we want to be, right? Because we're moving always into the future. Every movement is a step into the future. Um, and if we make that step successfully, it generates satisfaction, which is a technical term um, for satisfying the intent. So the intent is a want, it's an extension toward. Um, and the movement towards that is, is um, the, the uh, energetic, um, what's the word, um, work of actually achieving that, right? And technically it, it is work as well. Uh, especially as human beings, I like to move it with you because we are so um, uh, evolved to be uh, social creatures sharing not only our thoughts, but our feelings and intentions and desires. Um, and these are very basic to our survival, and they're very basic, it's the basic glue um, of, who and, of who we are uh, as a social creature, and who we are, therefore, as a family or as a community. Um, and you put these two things together, I like to move it as an individual, and I like to move it with you, we get this coherence of meaning-making, where we can get social meaning-making, what Colin Trevartan calls intersubjectivity. It's something greater than the sum of its parts, greater than the two individuals alone. Um, and this starts to produce that social cognition, that understanding of the, of the, of the other's intentions, and something arises that's much bigger um, and, and more um, elaborate as, as a result. So movement is generative. It's giving us that experience. Um, you can say that, um, that movement um, will achieve your desires. Right? It's also communicative, even when you don't intend it to be, because the way that we move is indicating something of our internal state, our levels of arousal, interest, feelings, and physiology, of course, our autonomic physiology. So it's communicating something all the time, and we coordinate each, uh, between each other um, in, in that way. Um, if you start yawning, for example, I might start raising my voice, because I understand that you're becoming disinterested and sleepy. Hopefully not yet. It's, uh, it's still the, the early morning. So, so moving underpins this learning and communication. It's the glue that, 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 that binds us together. And this shapes, in, in young children, it shapes development. And even in adults, it shapes how we learn about each other and about the world. Now, if we look at biomechanics, movements are prospective by necessity because they generate forces of momentum and, and inertia that must be compensated ahead of time. So if I generate a force by acceleration this way, I need to make a, a, an equal and opposite compensatory force to bring that movement to a quiet close. If I can't do that very well, I'll smack into the wall and I'll hurt my hand or I'll hurt the wall. Um, similarly, if I don't give enough force to it, I won't touch the wall at all. And that will be absolutely have no adaptive effect, not very functional. 
So movement is prospective. In that sense, we need to have an understanding of where that movement is going. And that's where the mental gets in, right? That's where movement becomes mind. Right? So movements are not non-mental, mindless reflexes from our perspective as, as developmental psychologists. Um, they are purposeful acts that generate experiences. Um, and they generate the kinds of experiences desired by the agent, the individual. Um, they must be efficiently, prospectively, perceptually guided. And in that sense, this is a very basic kind because it's understanding very basically where that's going. And it, you need a per perceptual information to monitor and to control and guide that movement, a bit like a tightrope walker who wants to, uh, to, to walk and hit the other end of the, uh, the tightrope. He must balance the movement to achieve that particular goal. And he does this by swaying side to side. And in we, indeed, we do that very efficiently the movement. We make these compensatory corrections that happen um, at very fast at a sub-second level. And we do this without thinking about it, or at least reflecting about it. So they, they have to know where they're going to achieve um, their effect. And they, they are affective in the sense that they are feelingful, um, because there's feeling within the movement. At a basic level, that satisfaction or frustration and distress if it's not successful. So this is uh, some footage from uh, Dave Lee on the Galapagos Islands, um, demonstrating some of the importance of movement. So this is slow motion. You can see the coordination here. And this is an inter-animal or inter-agent, inter-personal coordination now. The actions of one being res uh, responded to in a very coordinated manner by the actions of another. And all together, they make a unit, a dyadic unit. They're making a courtship dance. In fact, this is a, a kind of a kiss, you could say. Um, and by doing so, they're able to achieve the particular intentions at a very basic level that, 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 they, that they desire. Now, these are not conscious uh, intentions that we can abstractly reflect on. We have concepts to understand in intellectually. Um, they're much more of a primary kind. This is, what, um, this is the, the nature of intersubjectivity, the way that movement is coordinated and integrated in the minds or in the brains of two individuals to understand and coordinate our intentions together through movement. Uh, this is from uh, Colwyn Trevartan's very famous image. So this is a primary, what we call primary sensory motor intentions. They're acting toward a goal that is prospectively perceived. They're continuously sensed and guided to achieve that goal. Right? Uh, it's pre-reflective, pre-conceptual, and future-oriented, um, and it's simple. So for the sake of time, I'm, gonna, I'm going to skip, uh, just, just move very quickly over these, uh, th these slides. I showed this last time. This is, this is the fetus, because you, you asked the question, well, when is this kind of mind arising? Well, it arises very early. And we know from the work of Alessandro Piantelli and others that even uh, in, in, the, in utero, these movements are showing the first signs of being organized prospectively. Um, now, there's a lot of uh, work to do in, in, in terms of characterizing and qualifying this uh, much better. But the idea that these are non-mental reflex actions happening in utero uh, seems to be um, a little misleading. It seems to be that they are indeed anticipating their outcomes. Um, and therefore, that's the first signs of generating knowledge. Now, there's all kinds of questions here about, um, about its significance, about how that impacts on learning and development, um, whether or not that is indeed um, something that's disrupted um, so early uh, in, in, in the case of ASD. But what is clear um, is that, those are, that, that some of those movements are anticipatory. So they're anticipating their outcome. And that's the basis um, of, of what is the mental. Um, similarly, we did some work uh, on newborn babies. This is a, a neonatal baby at age 1.5 days. And again, you can see the movements of the arm are very fluid and very controlled, and especially the movements of the digits are very dexterous. Um, and again, these are not non-mental, mindless reflexes, um, but they are, in fact, part of the perceptual, and we would say prospective perceptual organization um, of, the, of the movement of that, of those, um, of that particular baby. So you can see the acute awareness, organization, um, and 
the developing intentionality in, in, in the movements. And that will become much more um, uh, sophisticated and uh, coordinated as that infant develops. Um, this, these are very important. They're not superficial. Um, we need to coordinate these, these motor intentions to achieve things that give us vital sustenance, to give us the foundation for life. Um, one of the most difficult tasks um, after birth is latching onto the breast for, for feeding. Um, it requires a lot of effort and coordination from both the mother's side and the baby's side. I mean, it often takes third-party interventions, midwifery um, support or grandmother support, to enable this to happen because it's a challenging task. Um, but the infant has the coordination and the skills and the prospect of awareness of what can be achieved um, already. And, and the mother and the baby will work to coordinate their levels of arousal, their desire, their intentions in order to achieve that particular goal um, which is so vital, which is latching onto the breast um, for successful feeding. And when that is achieved, uh, a degree of satisfaction results. And obviously the mother here, in this case, she's been through quite a big project. Um, and so her satisfaction is, uh, is very profound. And similarly, the infant, now latched to the breast, is making little sucking movements. And those little sucking movements, each themselves, is a little prospectively controlled act to, to, to increase the pressure in the mouth, to bring down the, the milk, and to, to, to get that vital, um, that, that vital sentence. So when we're talking about now movement in mind, it's of a very, very basic kind. It's not this abstract, conscious, reflective uh, mind that we, that we live our intellectual lives in. It's something more fundamental, which is why I put the, the, the boobies courting up there in the beginning. Um, and it, and it's, it appears to be evident from very early on. So this is what's now being called um, primary consciousness, right? So it's, it's the ontogenetic primary experience of, of what it is to live. And that develops with greater affective appraisal and greater reach into a secondary kind. But it's the tertiary um, which gives us the intellectual capacities um, with its cognitive tools of learning, memory, um, planning, conceptual um, organization um, to be able to do the kinds of very sophisticated projects that we do on a, on a daily basis, and that occupies most of our attention, in our, especially in our professional lives. Perhaps not so our, professional li uh, our personal lives, where we might want to get rid of the, 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 all the cognitive skills on a Friday night, for example, and reduce ourselves um, through inebriation, which, of course, um, we're very good at in Glasgow. So this is a sensory motor intelligence, and <clears throat> it's generative. It creates a desired future. It's anticipatory, and it knows ahead of time its outcome. It's structured in space and time over these small second, you know, sub-second intervals. Um, and it's agent-driven action response psychology. It's coming from the agent to create the kinds of sensory contingencies that that particular individual wants. And it delivers vital affective effectiveness. In the sense, it's important for our vitality. It's affective. It's got this um, feeling quality to it. Um, and it needs to be effective or functional. Right? Now, some of the most, uh, it, so it's one of the clearest images that, that shows the, the particular motor disruption in ASD, I think, is this one from Jennifer Cook, who's speaking, um, in fact, this afternoon. This is just from a simple arm swing paradigm where she's moving the arm back and forth um, to, a, to a metronome at first and then swinging, uh, swinging it like this. Um, we can see the velocity plot of, a, of the typical adults here in blue and the velocity plot of the um, adults with ASD in red. And you can see that, the, that the, the velocity peak is much higher here in the ASD population. And of course, that means that they accelerate faster and decelerate faster than, um, than in the, the, the typical population. But what's very interesting for me is this jerk. Now, jerk is the way that we're modulating the acceleration. It's a bit like having a foot on the accelerator and a foot on the gas. Now, if you, if you accelerate or decelerate smoothly, it's just one clean uh, press on the gas and one clean press on the brake. Um, but here we seem to be oscillating between brake, accelerator, brake, accelerator, brake, accelerator at a very fast pace at, 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 um, at what looks like from that graph to be about 13 hertz. Now what this means is that that movement becomes inefficient. It takes a lot of time and energy to do that. If you can imagine stopping at the red light and you're gas brake, gas brake, gas brake, gas brake, your car is going to wear out. You, you're going to take a lot of time and energy to be able to stop at that red light you, your brakes are going to wear out, your accelerator is going to wear out, you're putting a lot of stress on the system. Now, I think, now this is an open research question, but I think this is perhaps fundamental to the motor disruption in ASD. I don't know. This is the open question. Um, but what we do know is that there is a disruption in ASD in the motor system. Um, and that appears to uh, affect, from a developmental view, um, it appears to affect now expressive intention, 
um, and that can disrupt social and affective engagement. Right? So I've talked about how I like to move it, how movement is so fundamental um, to how we're feeling and to our uh, expressing our desires and intentions. Um, and I've explained something of the importance of how we need to coordinate that interpersonally um, with each other to be able to align those particular intentions expressed through movement um, together. So, um, and that forms the basis of our development, of our community, of our individual feeling of uh, self-worth, of confidence in success, um, and of being able to communicate and enact uh, our desires and to explore the world um, as curious, the curious agents that we are. So the synopsis for today is to look now at how movement generates experiences. Um, we understand now that disrupted movement will therefore disrupt experience, and this is really fundamental. Um, it can also thwart the motive to engage, because if, you, uh, if your movement is disrupted, the intention that you're aiming for is continuously disrupted, so it will disrupt your motive to engage in a particular uh, new movement or new possibility. Um, we know that movement is dis disrupted in autism, um, and uh, Nicole and Jennifer will, will speak to that um, and, and give us some, uh, some more data about that. So now the question, really, the question for today is, well, taken together, what do we do about this? Im how do we improve movement skills? Do we want to improve movement skills? Um, we know from education, uh, education work that, in fact, movement um, impacts a kind of motor um, literacy, as it were, impacts on social skills, um, peer relationships, and academic attainment, which is very hot on the agenda, especially for Scottish government. So if we don't move well, even you know, whether we have ASD or not, um, it can impact on, on, our, on our chances for success in education and therefore our lifelong uh, chances for success. So we need to take this knowledge um, and focus on, on autism and understand how to, uh, how to work um, uh, with, um, with children with autism better. And if we can do that well, um, then we can generate the kinds of successful movements um, that can be shared with others and, and that can express the best possibilities that that child um, has.